Well, let's continue with our types of epithelial tissue illustration and some definition. So this is types of epithelial tissue, abbreviated ET. Now here we're going to incorporate our shapes uh, and our layers along with some defining characteristics of each of these types. And so for our types, we're going to have seven of them. Okay, so I'll just say there are seven types of epithelial tissue. The first one is simple squamous epithelial tissue. Do you remember that simple meant one layer and squamous meant flat? And so here's my one layer of squamous or squamous, whatever you'd like to say. Just means flat. Simple squamous epithelial tissue. And you can tell that, and it's sitting on its basement membrane, you can tell that this tissue would probably be pretty easy to pass, say, a gas through if I were an O2 molecule, something like that. Let's make it blue for oxygen. So if I were O2, I could just go right through that nice little layer. How about the opposite of that? Let's have uh, carbon dioxide. Couldn't that easily pass through in the other direction? Sure. So just for clarity, I'll take that away. There we go. So oxygen, anything that could uh, easily get through one layer of, say, a tissue paper. That's a kind of a good thing to think about. Simple squamous in relationship to is just a one tissue, like a bath tissue thick. So what is our definition here with simple squamous? What does it do? It's for easy passage or a better word would be diffusion. Diffusion, right? So in examples of these, where you would find the simple squamous epithelial tissue would be in the air sacs of the lungs, the capillaries of the cardiovascular system, uh, and then body cavities where we need quick passage, say, of nutrients, uh, that kind of thing, through a membrane. So that's our first one, simple squamous epithelial tissue. Our second one is just like the first one, but it's a different shape. So this is, let's draw it first. This is going to be layers of cubes. Sorry, just one layer of cubes, actually, since we're doing simple. So a single layer of cuboidal epithelium, and without getting too precious on the visual here, I think you've got the idea that this is a cuboidal type cell sitting on a basement membrane again. And so this is going to be simple cuboidal epithelial tissue. And of course, I forgot my nuclei in there. So simple cuboidal ET, or epithelial tissue, really good for areas of secretion. Secretion. Maybe that cell is making something. Uh, mammary gland, for instance, making um, milk. So secretion or, conversely, absorption would be another one. Easy to get things out of the cell and easy to get things into the cell. So secretion and absorption. Some examples where simple cuboidal is found are in the kidney tubules the 
spelled that wrong. And my kidney tubules, which are just small tubes. The ducts, not like the kind that quack, but the ducts of glands. So you might have a little gland that's making something. Here's a little gland. And then here's some cuboidal cells lining the inside of the gland. And then when they make their product, it pops up out of the duct and onto whatever the surface is of the lumen where that gland lives. Another place you would find simple cuboidal are on the surface of the ovary. On the surface of the ovary in the female reproductive system. So we can think of secretion and absorption with simple cuboidal epithelial tissue. And our last one that sounds like the first two is simple columnar. Of course, we've drawn all of these together already. And remember that this one is tall and thin and sits on a basement membrane. This is not the pseudostratified one. This is just the simple columnar. Simple columnar. epithelial tissue. Okay, and I'm going to add a little something fun to this one that look like fingers. Not hairs, but little fingers. Now we could say that those little fingers were called micro, meaning small, villi, which means small finger. The uh, Singular of that is villus. I believe that's two L's. Detail. Okay, so microvilli on top of simple columnar epithelium. Usually you can see this at the brush border of the intestines. And the brush border of intestines is where we absorb our nutrients that we get from breaking down our food. So let's talk just a little bit about what the simple columnar ET could do. They would be for absorption, which is what I just mentioned. So we're thinking about absorption of food, uh, absorption and secretion. Here's one, protection. That's an, a new one for us. See where we would find this stuff. We would find simple columnar epithelium in the lining of the digestive tract, which would be the brush border. might find it in the uterus. We want to be aware of that extra thing, microvilli. Let's talk about microvilli for just a second. A microvillus is just a continuation of the cell membrane it's going around, I'm just drawing the top of a columnar cell there. It's just a continuation. So here's another one next to it, and the little microvilli are sticking up. Now, what, what would be the point in having these folds? Microvilli are folds of the plasma cell membrane. So it's still the cell membrane, but it's just the fold. 
It's like pinching it up at the top. In this case, it would be for absorption, but microvilli or any kind of fold in any membrane is really to increase the available surface area. And that's something you'll want to know <laughs> forever. So whenever you see something folded like this, it means it's folded to increase the surface area. And in this case, the surface area is folded to increase the area for absorption of your nutrients. So there's our happy little columnar cell with the microvilli inside the brush border of the intestines. And that increases the amount of space, literally, that you have to bring nutrients through your body, uh, through the membrane and into your uh, cells and then into your bloodstream. Okay, so let's continue. Our next type of epithelial tissue is called pseudostratified ciliated columnar. Now, pseudostratified is one that we mentioned before when we drew that set of columnar cells that they didn't all look like they were standing straight up. So you might be deceived by one or two appearing not to actually touch the basement membrane. But if we add the nucleus back in, you can see that a scalpel Cutting a tissue section may have cut it on an angle. Cells are leaning in different directions when the samples are taken. It just makes sense. Then we're going to add an extra type of cell to the end of this cell. And I'm making it kind of fat. Cool little cleft note. And I'm also going to color this yellow. Because this type of cell is associated with our pseudostratified cell. And now I'm going to add cilia, which these little hairs that move in a fashion where they sort of wave, kind of like rowing a boat. They have a a flow to them. They can move things along their surface if they all sweep in the same direction. So you think about cilia sweeping. That's what these little hairs are. And then we have this other cell here. This is a goblet cell, which makes mucus. So if we combine these two things, the cilia, which are sweeping on the surface, on the apical surface, and then the goblet, which are interspersed in between these columnar cells that appear to be leaning over, we have something that is collectively known as pseudo-stratified ciliated, just having trouble spelling here, ciliated columnar epithelium. Now that's a mouthful, isn't it? Pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. And so that tells us we've got all of these features as well. There's our cilia up at the top on the apical ends of these columns. Here is our appearing, appearing to be stratified, but not really, since we're all touching the basement membrane here. And it doesn't mention the word goblet, but goblet is associated with the pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. 
Now we know goblet cells make mucus and that, goblets, uh, that mucus is a secretion. So one of the easiest things you can think of for the jobs of these cells is secretion. Not necessarily only of mucus, but good enough. Protection. Here's our secretion and our protection. And where could we put these? And let's note our additions for secretion and protection. We have cilia for sweeping. I'll explain that in just a minute. And then we have goblet cells for mucus production. Okay, so now where might you find this? An example would be in the, uh, or lining the respiratory tract. And if you're not clear where that is, we could think of the, particularly the trachea. And think about dust particles that you inhale. They get sucked into the into your airway, either through your nose or through your mouth, and then they travel down into your trachea. Let's make them orange since I think about pollen. And so they travel to your trachea, and your trachea's job is to prevent them from getting all the way down into the air sacs of your lungs. And so the cilia sweep. The cilia sweep that pollen, we'll just say, back towards your mouth. And the way they do it is by keeping a layer of mucus on top, which was secreted by the goblet cells, and that catches that pollen. And we can move the pollen upwards and back towards the mouth and prevent it from actually getting down into the respiratory system. All right, let's continue. A fifth type of epithelial tissue is many layers of these scale-like squamous cells. And as they move to the surface, say if everybody starts down here at the basement membrane, and then over time, they move upwards, you might notice that they thin out at the top until they actually just flake off. And I bet you can guess that this is skin. Just going to add some arbitrary nuclei in here. But note that each one of these cells has a nucleus, a single nucleus. Right. So we're sitting on a basement membrane. In this case, this basement membrane is towards the surface of the body. That you could see, so this would be your skin, and then there's another surface that we don't see very often, but those would be the mucous membranes, um, like in your mouth and your throat. So let's name this stratified squamous epithelial tissue. And the job of this tissue is very simple. It's protection. How it does it is not so simple, but we can just think of this as a protective layer. Where is it protecting us? Well, it's protecting us on the outside, the most obvious one, and then there's an inside one. So let me back up just a little bit. There are two types 
of this protective stratified squamous one type is called keratinized. Keratinized. Let me spread those letters out just a little bit and change the color so that you'll... Keratin is a protein that you find in skin. So keratinized, keratinized means that that protein is there in the epidermis. So keratinized epithelium, let's put that in the epidermis of the skin. And the other type is going to be the kind that has no keratin. So that'll be non-keratinized. Keratin gives uh, the stratified squamous epithelial tissue kind of toughness to it. And so in non-keratinized areas that don't have keratin but are still considered to be stratified squamous, we want that area to be uh, more like a mucous membrane. So let's think of the mouth is the uh, stratified squamous lining the inside of the mouth, the throat, the vagina, and the anus. These are all areas of non-keratinized epithelial tissue that are inside the body as opposed to keratinized on the outside. All right, we've got a couple more, so I'm just going to go on to the next page here. Our last two is transitional. Remember that one? Hmm. Let's just go back real quick and make a note here. This example that I've drawn here is keratinized. And the reason that you can tell it's keratinized is I said that it gets very thin up at the top and it starts to flake off as these cells die. And so we're going in this direction from the basement membrane. That would be keratinized. An example of non-keratinized would be a layer, several layers of squamous, the stratified squamous that didn't flake off or really get thin up at the top. They're all kind of spongy looking. However, because both of these layers, sorry, both of these types, both keratinized and non-keratinized, are subjected to abrasion often, even though these don't really thin out the same way, the non-keratinized still lose them. Because, you know, you eat things like Doritos, Anything that abrades or is rough on the inside surface of your mouth, for instance, where there's no keratin for toughness, then those cells wind up uh, having to be replenished quite often. So this would be a mucosa. Mucosa. And then keratinized might be the cutaneous membrane. Uh, let's just say the skin. Okay, so that's the difference in those two. We'll, we'll look at that a little bit more. All right, so let's move back on to transitional epithelium. And we said this one is really going to be a series of different cell types. So here's our columnar. Right, and we're going to add some layers of cubes, the cuboidals on top of those. And they might not be always distinctly cubes, but we'll add some cells that look more like squamous cells on top of those. And now we've got several different appearing shapes and several layers. So this is more complicated as far as epithelial tissue goes.
We call this transitional epithelial tissue. And they appear to be many layers. Appears to be many layers. And of course, it's not stretched out right now. In the bladder, the urinary bladder, which is a great place to find it, uh, in the urinary tract, of course, it's going to stretch out as it fills up to contain urine. So where we're going to use this, I'm just going to write urinary bladder and urinary tract, such as the urethra, um, or really the ureters, where it's going to stretch, and it's going to stretch. And so this tissue always looks kind of bunched up to where you can actually see the surface looks a little, it's not actually rough, it's just bunched up because it's not stretched yet. Okay, but if we were to stretch it out, it would flatten out, and then it would clearly be one layer. Uh, well, it would look like one layer. Inside of the urinary bladder, where this is transitional epithelium, it's called the urothelium. Urothelium. Okay, the trick with this is it can stretch and then recoil. I was going to say it can stretch and recover, meaning it can regain its original shape. Okay, and then our last type we'll move on to is called glandular. And just for two examples of glandular, I'm just going to draw one type here. That's a little imagination or pocket and the tissue. These cells are very interesting. Think about how they get replaced and what they make. So here I've got one cuboidal layer and now I'm going to do another cuboidal, and I'll make this one round, as though we were seeing it in cross-section. Okay. We could have a uh, Example of simple columna. You can imagine these are columna. They look a bit cuboidal, but let's pretend they are tall and thin, colon columns. Okay, so this is glandular. epithelial tissue, and it can be simple, columnar, or cuboidal. And you would find these in the glands. So we're making manufacturing or synthesizing a product is going to be secreted um, onto an epithelium, epithelial surface, excuse me. And yep, they are all sitting on basement membranes. So I'm just outlining the basement membrane of each of these, even though they're in glands. Okay, so glands have some sort of secretory product that they are exuding out into a lumen. 
Let's think of simple cuboidal. I'm going to divide these up. Here, let's see, simple columnar AT secretion. Either into a duct and then onto a surface which makes them what's called an exocrine gland or without a duct or as we say ductless directly into the bloodstream. We might equate that with hormones because I'm going to tell you that's called the endocrine secretion. Crying is secretion and endo is inside and so exo would be an outside secretion. Okay, so simple columnar, we can use it for that. Um, how about simple cuboidal? Just gonna make sure we've got two different ones here. So let's do simple cuboidal is the other one. It's running out of room here. One, two. ET, and this one is also for secretion, but we want to associate it with uh, um, salivary glands, mammary glands for milk. oil glands, like sebaceous glands. All right, so the oil on your skin. So that's the second one. Simple columnar and simple cuboidal. Well, let's just say there's two types here. Two types of glandular epithelium. Okay, and that covers it for epithelial tissue. Thanks for watching.